Hey, it's Sammy for another episode of the I Do Music Podcast. And our goal and our mission is to empower and educate musicians and artists worldwide. And on today's episode, we sat down with entertainer and radio legend Frank Ski discussing how he worked in law and DJed in the DMV, sustaining in radio throughout the years, and his success and failures in entrepreneurship and business. Hey, it's Sammy for another episode of the I Do Music Podcast. And I'm sitting down with the great, the legendary... Frank Ski, you don't really need much of an introduction. We know that name, on our personality, to DJ, to philanthropist, and the list goes on and on. And we're going to talk about some of those things. How you feeling? I feel good. You make me feel old when you say legendary. Like, legendary I mean, is like old. living legend. No, no. <laughs> I feel like I'm a legend, and I don't feel old. There you so. go. Okay, I received that. <laughs> so, born in Harlem, right Harlem, in D.C.? Yep. That's Born in Harlem, raised in South Florida, and then went to D.C. for college and started my professional career in D.C. and Baltimore. School? Well, I went to, uh, for college, mm-hmm. I went to the University of the District of Columbia. Many D.C. people think I went to Howard mm-hmm. because I hung at Howard all the time, mm-hmm. and I basically slept on campus at Howard, but um, I went to UDC. <laughs> UDC. But we know the DMV is a special place, and we're yeah. getting into all of that, but... Um, that's interesting. I don't think I knew that you were raised in South Florida. Yeah. But it kind of makes sense for, um, you know, some of your influences and then, you know, even coming to Atlanta. Yeah. Um, that Southern. Yeah. That Southern feel to, to you, but also having been been some places. Yeah. Right. And that was Miami, of uh, old school Miami. So it wasn't like real cosmopolitan like it is now. Right. You know, but there was a lot of influence of New York and Miami at the time. And then, you know, it was like very international with the Latin community and whatnot. How was it growing up in South Florida? Like a a side, I mean, like the parties. South Florida. No, there were no no parties. parties. There was none of that. It was kind of real boring. Really? Yeah. It was kind of real boring. Especially. Why did you move there? uh, I went to live with my father. Gotcha. Yeah. So I grew up with my father down in South Florida. So I kind of was like the rural kid. So there was, you know, Miami doesn't really have like a city, like that city life or anything. Mm -hmm. So it was very, you know, um, I don't know if you want to call it like urban at all. It's just very, I mean, you know, it was like everywhere took an hour to get to unless you had a bike. Because, you know, there's no pub, there was no good public transportation. This is like old school Miami. Very different. So you were like, I need to go to D.C. for school. So, you know, so my mom came into some money and she was like, um, you know, what are you going to do when you graduate? And my father was kind of like real old school. So my dad was kind of like the guy that was like, <clears throat> when I graduated, he he said, um, you got three choices. So you can either go to college, go to the military, or pay rent right, and live at home. Right. Like it was like the day after I graduated. It wasn't like a lead up. It wasn't like, what are you going to do next year? It was like, I woke up and he was like, yo, I need to talk to you. Like you either going to go to college, go, but he This is, like, after I graduated. From high school. Yeah, so all my friends kind of went to the University of Miami, and a lot of them playing football. So I rode my bike to the University of Miami and tried to register, and the lady looked at me and was like, you were supposed to apply last year. But nobody ever told me because I went to, like, a predominantly white high school. Yeah. And when you were black in Miami back then, if you didn't play ball, like, nobody— I, I I never saw a counselor in high school. I didn't know. I, I didn't know. So, wow. yeah, so she was like, well, you were supposed to apply last year. And I was like, well, I didn't know, so can I apply now? Right. And she was like, no. She was like, but have you taken the SAT? And I was like, the what? Wow. Like, I didn't even know about the SAT or none of that. Right. You know, um, and I remember, so I came home and I was like, okay, this is crazy. So I was going to do the military route. And then, you know, he was like, oh, you can pay you know, Sorry. all this money to live at home, but minimum wage was like nothing. So uh, my mom had called me miraculously, and she was like, I came into some money. You need to come go to college in D.C., and that's how I wound up in D.C. Wow. Yeah. That is crazy. No counseling support. No, no nothing. No anything. nothing. And I got to D.C., and my mom lived in New York, but I had an aunt in D.C., so I thought I was going to live with her, and she kind of put me out after two weeks. She was over it? Yeah, I mean, you know, she really didn't want me in the first place. She just wanted my mother's money. So uh, she put me out, and I remember she came to my job, and she was like, well, you don't live with me anymore. Take this bus, this bus, this bus. And I had just got to D.C. like two weeks. She was like, take this bus, this bus, this bus, and there's an apartment complex, and you, you know, I put your stuff there. I only had a box. I had a box of my clothes that was like a box, like not even suitcase, just a box. And um, so I took the bus there. And it was like this raggedy old 
building with no air conditioning, bunch of roaches, mice. It was like terrible. And I lived in this place and I didn't really have like a job or anything. So it was kind of like I was really on my own. Wow. But I had refused because I felt like my dad like dissed me and put me out. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I ain't calling him. Right. You know, I'm going to make it. Yeah. I'm going to make it. I remember I was, yeah, eating off food trucks, not having no money, like practically homeless. Yeah. Wow. That's kind of why I'm not tolerant for like laziness because I'm like, yeah, y'all ain't struggling. I'll tell you what a struggle is. Facts. Yeah. yeah, and people wouldn't really know that about you had they not had those conversations mm -mm. that you, you know, you're very, um, you you worked hard for the success that you've had today. And some people, you know, wherever they came in on your journey can only see but so much of but it. But so much so of I it, yeah. That's why I'm happy I have you here. You can yeah. talk about these things. So how did you even discover that you had this love for radio? Where, where did radio come from for you? So, you know, interesting enough, it was never radio for me. Interesting, um, when I got to D.C., I had an aunt that worked at the U.S. Attorney's Office. And um, she was like, I'm going to give you a summer intern program, but it's going to be paid. It was only like 20 hours a week. You know how that is. Mm -hmm. And it kind of wasn't enough to pay the rent. But because I had met people you know, working in the U.S. Attorney's Office, I eventually worked for the uh, courthouse in D.C., and I fell in love with law. So I thought that was going to be my path, to be right. a lawyer. Right. But at the same time, I liked music, and I used to rap and uh, DJ, and I just decided that I was going to be a DJ. And while I was at UDC, I would do all the, the parties around school and play music and whatnot, and one day when I was at the courthouse, this is how God works, a guy comes in to get some files from me, and he says, aren't you the guy that DJs the parties around campus? And I said, yeah. He said, well, I'm a lawyer, but in my part-time, I'm the general manager of the radio station. Oh, wow. Of the college radio station. And he said, we don't have, like, a hip-hop show on the radio. Because back then, there, were only, there was only one other hip-hop show in the country, and that was Mr. Magic in New York. And he said... Would you come and play that? Um, oh, that's me. Sorry. He said, "Would you come and play that hip hop on uh, on our radio station?" And that's how I got into radio. Believe it or not. Wow. Yeah, it's crazy. That's interesting. Um, so, what were you studying while you were in school? Law. You, see? you were studying law. You studying thought you were going to go to law school. I thought I was going to go to law school. I thought that's what my whole thing was to be in law school. Isn't that crazy? That is crazy. Yep. I mean, so I thought it makes I was going to be a lawyer. DC. Yeah, and and I was good at it too, and I I worked on some big high profile cases that if we ever had that conversation, like you wouldn't believe some of the stuff I worked on as a paralegal. I and mean, but the it was crazy. Lawyers and personalities have um, the gift of gap. Well, you know what's interesting <laughs> is people always say like, what people have said that they like is that I do great interviews, mm -hmm. but I learned to interview by working with lawyers on their cases when they would do deposition and interview witnesses mm -hmm. and people in these cases. And I learned how to ask a question, mm -hmm. read body language, mm -hmm. ask the question three or four different ways, mm -hmm. getting answers. And it's funny how that's how God works. I mean, God wanted me to be in radio, but to give me the skills to do what I needed to do in radio, he put me in this situation with working in these law firms. And I'm sure that it also taught you other things, i.e. business and so on and so forth of like mm -hmm. how to, you know, all the legalities that come with entertainment, even though you weren't working in the entertainment. So, so what's really funny, and I'm, I'm glad you said that. So when I was at one of the law firms I worked at, I worked for one of the partners. Um, his name was Mike Lubin. And um, he called me in his office one day and he pulled out the, the D.C. paper, which is like creative loafing mm -hmm. and all this other stuff, right? Like the free city paper. And um, they had the best of D.C. in there. And then my picture was in there. I didn't even know. And it was like the best DJ in D.C. And it was like oh, me. Wow. So he calls me in his office and he's like, is this you? <laughs> so I thought like he was going to be like, like, you know, that's not cool for your image, for the firm and all that kind of stuff. And he was like, so why are you working here? Right. And I said, because this is what I love to do. And he was like, but why do you do that? I said, well, that's what I really love to do. Like, this is my job. And he said, well, why don't you make what you love to do your job? And I said, because what I love to do, I don't make no money. Mm 
Mm. Like DJs don't make no money. Mm -hmm. And he was like, so you're going to do this. You're going to go to law school. You're going to do all these years and you're going to make, you're going to come out as a first year lawyer and you're going to make this much money. And he said, but in entertainment, it's endless. You can make as much money as you can dream of. And I was like, there's no way. And he said, okay. He said, I'll make you a bet. I said, okay. He said, um, let me manage you. And this is like the partner at the firm. He right. was like teaching me everything. He said, let me manage you and I'll take 10% of everything you make. And I remember I was like 10%. It seemed like a lot of money, right? Mm -hmm. And then my father told me, he said, you know, how much are you making now? I said, nothing. He said, well, 10% of nothing is nothing. So right. if he's going to make you extra money, 10% is cool, right? So I said, okay, 10%. And the first thing he asked me was about DJing parties. And he said, how much money do you make DJing parties? And I said, well, like, you know, $200, $300 a party. And he said, really? And he said, well, how many people go to the parties? And I said, I don't know, five or 600 people. And he's like, well, how much do they pay to get in? I said, like $10. He said, oh, so they making 5000 and they giving you two, $300. or $300. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, if I don't do it, somebody else is going to do it. See, that's that. Negro mentality, right? Mm -hmm. And he said, but you're the best. And didn't the paper say you're the best? And I said, yeah. He said, if you're the best, then you got to get the best That's money. Right, right. And he said, the first thing you're going to do is stop talking for yourself. He said, so anybody want to hire you, they got to call me. And then the second thing is, they're going to pay you a deposit of 300 And then they're going to give you a dollar for every person that comes through the door. And I said, are they going to take that? He said, yeah. He said, 300 or a dollar a person. That's going to be your rate. Let me talk. And he said, in the first year, you're going to make over $200,000. Wow. And this is like 1985. And I was like, you crazy. And the first party I did, the first party was a Sunday night party in Baltimore. And I remember. And I hired, I had a girlfriend. And I said, sit at the door, 8 o'clock, and just click. Right, right. I'm going to be there like 11. But you get there at 8 and just click. So she got there at 8, sitting on a stool, and was clicking. And I got there, of course, there was the line outside and whatever. And I got in and the place held like 500 people. So it was 500 people. And um, when it was over, you know, I'm talking, you know, Baltimore is like a rough place. And she's like, we got to go like now, like get your stuff and let's bounce. And I was like, are you sure? She was like, yes, we got to leave now. And I, I had an efficiency like a raggedy place in Baltimore. And we got yeah. in. She opened up her big purse in this big bag. Of, of like money. cash. And she was like, 800 people came. No, she said 1,800 people came. I said, 1,800? She said, yeah, because it was packed from 8 o'clock until 2 o'clock in the morning. It just kept, they kept cycling through. It was like 1,800 people. Wow. And I was doing that like four nights a week. Wow. Yeah. As a young making paper. Like, so much money, I didn't even know what to do with it. <laughs> like, it was crazy. That's amazing. But, I mean, it's also just a testament of, you know, one... I'm happy that he was there and present in your life to give you that, yeah. um, but also betting on yourself. Yeah, you know, and, like and you know, but he, he, it was interesting. I think people kind of make a mistake when they, they don't understand the relationship between a mentor and a mentee, right? So he was my mentor. So I had to submit to his teaching and knowledge. And even things that he told me that I didn't believe, I still did it because he was that guy. Mm -hmm. And he became like my father figure. Mm -hmm. He told me to buy my first computer. He told me to buy a tuxedo. And I was like, for what? He said, you're going to need it. And I was like, no, I don't. And he said, you will. And buy a black suit and a blue suit, you know, black shoes and brown shoes. And like, I had all this stuff and I was like, what do I need all this for? And as soon as it started hitting, I needed everything he said, mm -hmm. you know, and he just taught me just like class etiquette, the whole nine yards. And uh, I think that um, if it wasn't for him, my life probably would be in a different place. Absolutely. Wow. So you have had your fair share of um, years in radio, be it through different markets. Mm -hmm. um, but Atlanta has definitely been a home for you. Um, I grew up listening to you. I worked with you yeah. um, at V103. Um, and you had the Frank Ski Morning Show. Right. But before we got to the Frank Ski Morning Show, what were you doing? What was like the very, because I feel like for aspiring radio talent, personalities, um, it's competitive. 
Um, it's probably, you know, everybody's not built or cut out to do, to be the talent. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and I'm sure that hasn't changed. Like it's, it's been pretty competitive from the, you know, you know, one thing I, I, I will tell you is that, um, during the time that I started in radio, <clears throat> I did nighttime radio. Mm -hmm. So I was the DJ on at night. And because I was already a DJ, I did my own mixing on the air. So right. I wasn't a DJ that had a DJ mixing for me. I, I did my own thing. Mm -hmm. And then when the music wasn't what I wanted, I started making my own music and was putting out a lot of hit records and everything. And We can get into those hit yeah, records. Yeah. So, so you want me... Say it now or wait. Uh, we, I mean, we can get into it. We can, however you so, want to tell the story. So, I started making records based upon what I was mixing on the air and in the clubs. And like, for instance, when I did Doo Doo Brown, I actually made the beat just to play it on the radio, mm. and it became so popular. Mike Lubin, the lawyer, was like. You need to make it into a record. I said, I don't know nothing about the record business. He said, well, you know somebody that knows something. Right. And I actually knew somebody because they would bring me records who knew somebody. Right. And I eventually wrote and did like Doo Doo Brown. But then I did all the other records, like all the Luke records and Hoes in the House and all these records. And, and I think all of that plus being a DJ laid a groundwork that the streets knew who I was. Right, right, right. So when I translated to, when I transferred into radio, they already knew who I was. So yes, the popularity too, was like mm -hmm. instantaneous. It wasn't, it didn't take a long time. It was like instantaneous. And, and I say that for a reason. So when I came to Atlanta, there was already a lot of people who knew who I was, mm -hmm. even though I wasn't from Atlanta. Gotcha. But what I saw was, I saw again, a need. So I got to Atlanta, and Atlanta was very Southern hip-hop, right? So I'm in Baltimore and D.C. and New York, and we didn't know nothing about Outkast, Goody Mob. Like, that wasn't really our thing up there. You know, New York was popping at the time. And I remember, and then the stuff that I was doing in Miami or the club music in Baltimore. So I got to Atlanta, and I went to a party and there was some very popular Atlanta DJs, I'm not going to say their name, and some radio DJs and some DJ DJs. And they were hosting, like, the biggest party in Atlanta. And I walked into this party, and I realized that they were so disconnected with the audience, right? Mm -hmm. It was, like, them and their VIP, and then it was, like... The party. The party. Mm. And I walked in, and all my guys were happened to be visiting from up top, and they were like, Negro, you going to kill it in Atlanta. And I was like, I just got to find the spot. And I found Club Kaya. And Kaya was um, just the four walls and four speakers in a long bar and a stage. And I remember I went into Kaya, and I said, I want to do a party called Northern Exposure. And I said... I don't want no sections, no nothing, just a dance floor because mm -hmm. I want people to dance. Mm -hmm. And the, I remember the first time I went to Kaya, there was these Atlanta DJs in there playing again. And the stage was empty. And it was just the DJs, like the focal point, but the stage was empty and the floor. And I was like, why don't y'all let people dance on stage? I don't, want, I don't want them people around me. And I was like... Them people was like paying you, like right. they paying the money. So I already knew there was an open environment for that DJ that can come here and really serve the people. And Northern Exposure did that. And I remember when I first, I got on the radio in November. The first Northern Exposure party was Martin Luther King birthday weekend, like January 15th. So in two months, um, I did the first Northern Exposure when I got there, there was 3,000 people outside. Oh, my God. And it was already crowded inside. And I knew at that point that I would be successful in Atlanta because I kind of felt like there was something that they wanted that they weren't getting. Right. It was a need. There were so many transplants from up north living in the south. 
and they didn't get what they wanted. Right. They were kind of like forced on the Southern right. hip hop. And ironically, even when I did Northern Exposure, I played all the Southern hip hop. Of course. But I also played house music. Right. And club music. Right. And up North hip hop and everything that they were yearning for, you know. And um, that in and of itself, that street stuff transferred to the direct success of radio. What pro- what probed the move to Atlanta in the first place, though? It was like... So so I'm in um, Baltimore, and um, there was a very famous DJ in Washington, D.C. His name is Donnie Simpson. He's a long-time, um, big-time DJ. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's, he did BET. He was like the first video host on what's BET and whatnot. And... Um, Donnie Simpson's contract was coming up in D.C., and they had called me and asked me if I would be interested in taking that seat. Right. And I thought, like, I'm about to be it. Like, right. you know what I mean? It's yeah, like, this is it, right? Because I'd already built up in Baltimore radio that following, and Baltimore and D.C. is, like, right together. Mm-hmm. And um, it was, like, at the last minute, Donnie Simpson signs his contract. And I'm like, damn. Damn. So a couple days go by, and then they called me, and they said, well, Donnie signed, as you know. And I said, yeah, I heard about it in the news. And, he, and they said, what about Atlanta? And I was like, Atlanta? It was like, yeah. Now, the only thing I knew about Atlanta was Freaknik when I used to perform at Freaknik, right? Mm-hmm. So I didn't know Atlanta. And I thought Atlanta at the time, I thought my opinion was it's southern, like, I'm up north. How am I going to come to Atlanta? Right? And Atlanta wasn't the Atlanta it is now. Right. It was just getting there. Like, Mm -hmm. it was bubbling, right? Mm -hmm. But I remember I came down, and they put me, which is now, I think, the West End, but the Swiss Hotel right next to Lenox. And I remember they gave me a corner suite, and I looked out the window, and I saw Lenox Mall And then I saw Phipps Plaza, and I was like, oh, that's dope. They got two malls across the street from each other, right? Mm -hmm. And I remember, like, living in D.C. or in like Baltimore didn't have an upscale mall. Mm -hmm. And D.C. didn't have an upscale mall. It was like out in Alexandria or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. So they didn't have, like, stores that – and I was really big into buying, like – is that my phone again? Sorry. So we, we I, did ask. Yeah, I know. Prior to. I know. You know and I turned it off, too. You a busy man. I know. That's the emergency. That's that ring. Somebody's mm-hmm. at my door. So anyway, so I, I remember that um, I looked out the window and I saw, and I said, let me go walk to Lenox. And I walked to Lenox Mall. And when I got there, they had valet parking. Mm-hmm. Now, people that live in Atlanta, like, y'all take that for granted. They ain't have no valet parking at the malls <laughs> in New York. Like, Fifth Avenue ain't got no valet parking if you go to New York. Like, all these places, they don't have no valet parking. So I didn't I didn't know, like, what that was. Mm-hmm. And I saw the cars. And I was like, damn. Like, they doing it in Atlanta. And all I saw was black people getting out these cars. And I said, Atlanta is doing it. That's exactly what I said. And I... And I remember I took a week and went out. And I'm going to tell you the thing that, that really got me to live in Atlanta. You're going to laugh. So I'm doing, I'm going out to it a It wasn't Freaknik, so I'm surprised. No, no I was, because I didn't like Freaknik because I performed at Freaknik. But, but I remember I was going out every night of the week. And somebody had invited, invited me to a club called Chili Peppers in Buckhead. And there was a party that night. And it was for the Outcast album release party. So I get to this party. And I'm at the bar, and Outkast comes in, and everybody's holding the banners. And it was like a big deal because this album was getting ready to drop. And um, I'm standing at the bar, and everybody in there, it was crowded, and everybody's hot, smoking weed, everybody's drinking. And, you know, when you have a party like that up north, somebody's going to be fighting, right? Mm-hmm. But down here, everybody was like, cool. Yeah. Everybody was chilling. Everybody was partying. And I was at the bar, and I remember... Jagged Edge was at the corner of the bar, and I was standing there, and Wingo, he didn't know me. He's like, you all right, dog? Do you, you, you good? I said, yeah, man, I'm good. He said, you know, we partying, blah, blah, blah. Have a drink with us. That's and I remember I did, he didn't know me. I didn't know him, and we was drinking and partying. And I was like, Atlanta is it, and that's why I moved to Atlanta and took the job. That's dope. I'm happy to hear that because yeah. I pray that, you know, with 
as you see Atlanta moving and changing, and we'll get into those things too, you know, because you've been able to see back and forth how things have, have changed, um, that we can keep that same sort of hospitality in yeah. the city and be as welcoming. But it is different. You, I go to D.C. and you definitely don't see a bunch of black people getting out of those luxury no. cars. No, So it's different. Um, my, so my question. So you, you end up getting the Frank Ski Morning Show. I'm sure there were many things mm-hmm. that came in between that stage of you DJing and like really putting your name uh, or getting your name even more exposed here in Atlanta. Right. Uh but then, then you got a, a morning show, which is for people who work in radio, is like right. the biggest deal. It's right. like that's the top spot. That's where you're getting the most traffic um, and engagement. How did that come about? And it was a Frank Ski morning show. How did it feel to know, like, okay, I'm really at this point getting my own right. platform? I had and, I had done I had done um, four years of morning radio before I came, oh. so I understood how it worked a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, and I brought my crew with me, except for Wanda. But everybody else, I brought with me. Like, and um, other so I, talent, or yeah, other talent. Mm-hmm. So I brought Griff, who was the comedian, Tara Thomas, who was the producer, me, Bubby, who who worked in my promotions team, Danny, who was um, the uh, technical guy. So I brought my crew with me, and I remember that um, the the show that they had on before was Mike Roberts. And Mike Roberts was very big into making people in Atlanta better, right? And then the competition was all, like, funny, funny. So you had Tom Joyner, who was, like, funny, funny, and then Ryan Show, who was funny. And um, then you had Mike Roberts, who was very serious. So all I did was take what Mike Roberts was doing, making sure I did the people's work, talking politics, talking culture— talking issues, but then also add the funny to it. Mm-hmm. And it kind of like changed. The other piece that I added, which to this day, 20 years later, is still the number one radio feature in Atlanta. It's the number one radio feature in this city on any station, black, white, anything, is the inspirational vitamin. And we, we can't remember that Atlanta is the Bible Belt. Like, it's the southern hub of black preachers and black religion right it's it's martin luther king who's Mm -hmm. a black preacher you know what i mean Mm -hmm. it's it's historically black colleges that were set up by the black church right it's auburn avenue it's black churches this is atlanta Mm -hmm. right and every famous black neighborhood has got a huge black church attached to it and nobody in secular radio was talking to the black church Mm -hmm. and the inspirational vitamin was that thing that did it for them. And I think that, um, we just happened to put it all together and it, and it really worked. That's what's up. Yeah. Yeah. And And that was it. And I mean, now moving years later to now you have the morning culture. Yeah. It's very different. It was a, uh, Basically, I'm curious to know why um, it moved from being the Frank C. Morning Show to the morning cultures. Like, your name's not attached to it, um, which is usually what you hear mm-hmm. in most, like, popular, like, morning shows or shows in general. It's like yeah. so-and-so show. Yeah. Um, so what's, what would you say the significance of that change in that brand branding? I think um, they were trying to, because um, we had that conversation about doing that. But part of it was to create something that was just not reliant on my name, but would rely on the strengths of everybody in the cast. And when you brought and they specifically um, got people that had big social media um, uh, footprints Mm -hmm. and presence and knew how to do it. Right. So social media, I get I know how to do. But these people like get and do it like it's a whole different thing like this this younger generation social media is like their lifeline for me it's like an added thing to what i already do what are, what to them are, yeah. it is it is the lifeline mm-hmm. you know and in order to be able to move forward we constantly have to be changing and thinking of the next thing and the morning culture was our step into the next thing and speaking of culture um, 
what's what do you what would you say or why would you say you have a responsibility to um, influence the culture? Like how how do you have a uh, responsibility to influence the culture? Being that you know, obviously reinventing yourself and or like sustaining in a business as things are changing. Yeah. Um, I mean, you have children who. I'm sure tell you what like what what you guys are probably playing all these things mm-hmm. that you may not necessarily even yeah like my son to. yeah my yeah, son. son yeah so my but, son thinks all the music is late you know my kids think we play music late well you know radio is not breaking <clears throat> yeah. records the same so it's yeah. we do play after it's yeah. already been established but at the same time I feel like I don't know adapting and and be, knowing that you have a huge responsibility to the culture my question would be how do you continue to like influence what ways in which ways are you making sure that you stay ahead of the trend and Mm -hmm. and keep them keep the people updated on what what it is what is the culture so i think we have to so i'll put it to you this way so i was listening to another radio show here in atlanta and they had a conversation that came out of left field about politics and i'm listening and they said, well, the Democrats are going to be in trouble because the Republicans only have one person to vote for when the election comes, and that's Donald Trump. But the Democrats got like 12 people to vote for. So on election day, the Democrats are going to be voting for 12 different people, and the Republicans are going to be voting for one. So basically, the Democratic vote is going to be split up. And I said to myself, damn. Damn. They have no clue yeah. how politics works. Right, right. You get what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like, they don't realize there's primaries, and then the Democrats will get down to one person. Right, right, right. But that's not how they presented it. Yeah. And it really shows that the show that we do is important because that's the thing that I talk about, is explaining the process of all of this. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And radio, see, what what happens now And our culture, unfortunately, is that the culture now gets all of their news from social media, but they only get their news in highlights, Mm -hmm. right? It's just blurbs. Headlines. And if there's something that they think is interesting, they'll click on it and read it. Otherwise, it's just highlights. So going home, when I tell you that news stations on television make nothing to what they used to make. Like, they're barely making it financially. Newspapers are gone. Magazines are gone. Mm-hmm. You, you get what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So the responsibility of the radio DJ is even more now than it's ever been before. But because of budget cuts, because of large conglomerate owners, they don't have the ability. So it's all just radio for black people is a lot of shucking and diving and joking and having fun and shout outs and parties and whatever, whatever. And they're not going to stop and really talk about the important issues. So that's when I have to have the responsibility to make sure that we do that for our culture is like to be a vessel of education and information to make sure people are woke as to what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. You answered that perfectly. Um, I'm I'm curious too with the changes. I mean, even going from like Frank Ski Morning Show to Frank and Wanda's Morning Show mm-hmm. to the culture. How did you manage to stay true to yourself while you're you're having to sell essentially like as a radio personality? Because you know we have these selling points, or you yeah. have certain things that you have to get off. Like even while you're trying to say the things that you want to say in your show, um, you know, like just staying to your, true to yourself and your brand while adding these different things into the mix. I'm curious as to your, how so, you're able to do that. So what happens is, um, and and when I talk to people who, who do radio and I'm trying to help somebody or to get into it, I always ask them the same thing. And it's it, it, it used to always be like, it would always be like a cliche, right? It would It was like, I remember the whole thing about everybody is a brand, right? So everybody's a brand. What's your brand? Me personally, I d- I don't think everybody's a brand. Why? I don't I don't think people know who the hell they are. True. I you can't be a brand if you're an exact copy of the next person, right? Mm-hmm. So everybody wants to be a brand. Know your brand, but a brand has uh, a code. A brand has an ethical responsibility. A brand has an identity. A brand has um, things that it's known for, 
right? So if you say McDonald's, you're going to think burgers, right? You say FedEx, it's like package delivery, right? Mm -hmm. Amazon, I'm going to buy something, right? Mm -hmm. So everybody's got a brand and they know what that is. So as people, what is your brand? So if somebody was to say, Frank Ski, what is the Frank Ski brand? I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure somebody would be able to say stuff about me. Like, what is Frank like? They'll be able to tell you what I like. Well, what does Frank do? Well, he's got the youth bowl and he's got his foundation. He does this with kids and blah, blah, blah. He plays in the – like they, they do that. But a lot of jocks that are on the radio, they what, what do they stand for? Like who are they? Mm-hmm. What do they do? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Okay, you can go to the club and you can get on the mic and scream on the mic. And I, I get that. And the club culture is important. But at the end of the day, it's important for who? I hate your phone. I hate my phone, too. So <laughs> the club culture is for who? Who's the club culture for? Mm-hmm. Right. And that's what um, I, I tell people. It's like, what is you what do you stand for? So I think that the reason why we've been able to stand the test of time is because we have specific things that we stand for. Yeah. And that's that's what it truly is. Absolutely. I have to move into your entrepreneurship. Okay. Because as we know, in radio, we tend to have like a thousand things going on. You just mm-hmm. named like all the things, some of the things that you do. Um, and I'm always curious to know how we manage to do these things in, in our business. But um, many people, including yourself, have always uh, told me to make sure that I had other things in place. As radio, we know things change at a drop of a dime. Mm -hmm. Um, So you, I think that's real danger for some people. I'll be the first person. I I don't think everybody should be diversified. Some people can't pay attention to the main thing they're trying to do now. Like you can diversify yourself when you've become great at At the one thing, right? At what you're doing, for sure, for sure, for sure. Yeah, because some people come to me and always ask. I say, say, "What do you do?" Well, I do this, I do this, and I do this, and I'd be like. Especially today. Everybody puts like 30 things in their bio. Yeah, no, no, no. But neither here nor there. In, in terms of radio, it's important to have several streams because, like I said, you could get fired at yeah. the drop of a dime. You could, things can just happen. So I've always been encouraged by my OGs, by my mentors to like, hey, you know, invest your money into this or like, you know, have some other things going on to where at least financially you're okay. You set out to uh, go into restaurant business. We mm-hmm. all know about Frank Ski's restaurant. Um, what made you pursue that venture what, what was the the motive behind that what because <laughs> i know i'm like oftentimes we speak about our wins and yeah. we speak about you know all the great things the positive things especially social media you have the yeah. highlight reel right but we shy away from so um, let me let me tell you values. let me tell you how let me tell you how this goes down sure. right so i'm just gonna keep it 100 percent real I, that's what i like okay I like so um my thing at first wasn't to own a restaurant. I wanted to own a lounge. And I had actually gone through the process and had a property that was in Buckhead by Lennox, uh, a big space that I was going to do um, a club called Color. And I had invested like a lot of money into it. Um, but I couldn't close the gap at the end because as I put all this money into it, hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, the recession hit. So when the recession hit, I kind of like lost all my money for that project because I wow. couldn't I couldn't close the gap of raising a couple million dollars in the environment that we were in because right. everybody was kind of like holding on to their money. Right. So um, y- the time goes by and um, an opportunity presented itself because myself and DJ Tay Rock, we started doing our own parties. Mm -hmm. because I saw like the trend of where Atlanta parties were going and I didn't like it. So I said, well, I'm just going to do my own party every Friday and then I'll go out and work for other people on other nights. And we started doing our own parties and still we kept splitting too much money with the owners. Um, And it finally got to the point we said we should just buy our own. Like, let's let's get our own. And the opportunity came up for the building that Frank Skies got into. And um, it was affordable and we could do it. And when I got in there, it was a struggle in my head because Tay Rock was like, well, let's just leave it like this. Let's just do this party, blah, blah, blah. And we couldn't, we weren't going to be able to really get a license just to do a club. Like we had to do something different because it was in Buckhead, right? Mm. And it was right on that border. So I had to get, a, like getting the restaurant license was easy. 
Like getting a restaurant license with live music and entertainment is easy. Getting a club license in Buckhead is like impossible. Right. So um, I went ahead and we said, OK, we'll, we'll do the restaurant. I didn't know nothing about running a restaurant. I knew what I liked and my scale of what I thought a restaurant should be was a little bit higher. So we wind up putting all this money to, to service a higher level of people. What I did not realize is that and I've said this to a lot of people, Atlanta is a very difficult city. If, if you want to be in certain businesses, because we don't have the talent, okay? So like a New York, a Chicago, an LA, a Miami, those are restaurant lounge cities where they do this, right? Atlanta is like we have clubs and then we have restaurants. Like putting them together is like a very difficult thing. And what I didn't know is that the managers, a manager that would want to manage a restaurant is going to manage a restaurant that closes at 10 o'clock so they can go home. So we were open to 3 o'clock in the morning. So no manager that was a good restaurant manager wanted to work for us. Then, because we were black-owned, no employees that were servers, that's the most important person because they're the ones coming to the table, like black servers, like white servers didn't want to work for us because we were a black-owned restaurant. Mm-hmm. And I didn't understand why. But then the high-end black servers... The ones that were in Atlanta wanted to work at Houston's, Ruth Chris, Chops. They want to work at all them restaurants. restaurants. Why? That's the most question. important thing, because Negroes don't like to tip. And we know that. Everybody knows that. Black people don't tip. So they weren't going to make no money. Mm-hmm. So we were forced to deal with like a certain pool of eligible people that were good people. But a lot of the stuff we had to be trained. So I'll give you an example. We became the number one or number two wine selling restaurant in Atlanta. Think about that for a reason. So we sold more high end wine than the big steakhouses in Atlanta because we had all the celebrities and I'm into wine. And yeah, I'm like, you're really into wine. Yeah, it's Mm -hmm. like a big deal. Right. Mm -hmm. So we selling all this wine and everything. We making all this money. We making we selling more high end wine than anybody else. Now, think about that, right? When we opened Frank Skis, there was two people out of 100 that knew how to open a wine bottle with a corkscrew. Marinate on that for a minute. 100 people could not open a wine bottle with a corkscrew because a lot of the servers that we had to use came from like Applebee's, Fridays, and stuff like that where they don't let the servers open up bottles of wine. Right. And it's not a place where they sell wine by the bottle typically, right. right? So the bartenders open up the bottles. And even the bartenders didn't know how to do it without the screw-on thing. Like to have like the whole wine presentation, like the, right. you know, you selling a $400 bottle of wine. Give me a presentation. Like, you know, open yeah, it the right way. It. Yeah, it. For sure. Like they didn't know how to do it. So everything that we did went into training. Right. And we were caught behind the eight ball because like every business where – Running out of money. We got to open. We're running out of money. But we got a whole staff of people that need to be trained. And we opened and became the most successful restaurant in Atlanta instantly. Like, Houston's would have 300 covers in a night. Frank Ski's would have 850 covers on a Friday night. Same night as Houston's would be open. Wow. We had, but then the success... Because in business, you don't want to be successful too early. Too early, right. But we were successful right away, and it killed us. Mm. But So our struggle was catching up with our success, Mm -hmm. you know? And then with that success comes everything else. It comes theft. I mean, I didn't know there were that many ways to steal until I got into the restaurant business. Like, stealing in the restaurant business is the biggest thing you want to know. From from people that that beg for a job. Beg for a job and then be the main ones who want to steal from me. And to them, it's not stealing because to them, they feel like, oh, they got it. So if I give my friends a free meal, it ain't going to hurt them. It's just a piece of salmon. It's just this. It ain't going to hurt them. But then at the end of the night, you know, you, you're you in the restaurant business. So you, you start to wonder, like, where all this food went that's not being rung up, but we're running out. Like, right. where is it all going? Right. To dumpster dive. You know what dumpster diving is? So dumpster diving no. is 
like, you know, the chefs or the prep people in the kitchen, like the food comes in and they might be having a party at their house. So they're going to take 10 pieces of salmon, wrap it, throw it in the trash can. And then at three o'clock in the morning, they come back and they jump in the trash can and they get it. That's dumpster diving. That's awesome. Or or bartenders, (laughs) bartenders bringing like their own bottle of Hennessy. And pouring out their own bottle that was in their purse. Like, you got to be like children. Like, only clear purses can come up in here. And stuff like that. Like, all the stuff that I was like, that can't be true. That's not going to happen. Or the amount of theft. Like, you know, you got got bartenders that are ringing up $1,500 in drinks. But then their tip out is $750. Like, really? Right. Where that happened at, right? Right, right, right. Or, like, just, just theft after theft and stuff like that. It just became... So much, it was so much of the negative side that took away from the joy of really what we were doing. Absolutely. And and that was tough. Was it worth the risk? Would you do it again? Um, it was worth the risk because um, I had to get it out of my system. Um, would I do it again? I would never open another restaurant again unless, you know, somebody like these high-end restaurants that came to me and said, oh, we want to borrow your name. Like they do at the airport, you know what I mean? Like the airport people, like they don't really own those restaurants in the airport. It's like operators operate it and they just use the, the people's brand, the name. Like for that, I would do it and just give me my 20% and let me go. I'd be fine. But actually being in there. Do it. And let me, t- let me tell you how ghetto. <laughs> let me tell you, I knew it was a bad thing. So I'm at my mom's house. My mother who worked at the restaurant. I'm at my mother's house, right? And the restaurant had closed and whatever, whatever. She was like, after it closed, did, did you make sure that you got yourself a good bottle of Opus One? It's like $400 a bottle. And I was like, yeah, it's okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm good, mom. I'm good. She was like, because if you don't have one, I got one. I'm looking at my ghetto-ass mama. It's like, <laughs> how did you? I looked under my mama's sink. She stole so much liquor. My mama. Like, love my mama to death. But she thought she was doing me a favor by making sure that she took it. Before everybody else took theirs. Welcome to the restaurant business. Yeah, I'm good off it. I'm good <laughs> off it. That's interesting. Um, yeah, I'm happy we were able to talk about that because I mean, I think a lot of times we yeah. we really share like all of the wins and we share like all the positive things. But for somebody who's really looking to get into some entrepreneurship so, and open up, a I, business. I will tell people business like take restaurant out of the word. But anybody that's black that wants to open a business, mm-hmm. you got to be prepared to be a, basically, you're running an adult kindergarten. Because everybody brings all their personal stuff to you. And we're black. So black people, you know, as soon as they start working for you, we become friends. We want to, you know, we want to get away with 50 things that we're not supposed to. We want to, like, you know what I mean? And and you got to be really, you almost got to be like the evil dictator mm-hmm. in order to really run your business property because otherwise people will run all over you. Sheesh. Yeah. All right. Um, we're, we've run out of a little time. I know cool. there are so many things we did not cover, but we need a part two maybe. Um, but I do want to ask you for the independent artists that listen to this as a, from a DJ, from an on-air, from a talent perspective, how would you recommend indie artists go about um, getting airtime or just like exposing themselves or, or their music in today's age? Well, uh, I would t- I would one of the things that I think a lot of artists miss today is networking, right? And networking is not about okay, you know, people always say, let's work, let's get together and work, you know. But people always think in their mind, what's in it for me, mm-hmm. right? So. I would tell artists today, if they, if they, anybody that wants to produce or be in this business, to take a step back and understand what success is made of. Mm -hmm. There's one thing that you will see, and here's the crazy part, and that you will see that all successful people in the music business have been able to do. And that that is, they will all tell you that they were part of somebody else's success. Right. So if you want to take this business of music and entertainment and make it work for you, you've got to be able to make it work for somebody else first. Like you're going to get yours. But the thing is, like, how can I help you do this? Right. Mm -hmm. So 
You want to be a club promoter? How can you help another promoter be great? Because in that process, you're going to learn the do's and don'ts. And then when it's your turn, you're going to do it better than they did it, right? Right. So you want to be a, a musical producer? How do you do that? Like if you're not, if you're not in the business of really working and getting with other people, it's not going to happen. What I'd like to see happen, and I don't even know if they have it, but you know, nowadays workspaces are really popular, right? Mm-hmm. So workspace incubators. And the white folk have been able to really utilize this to the T. Like white folk have been able to utilize this to a T. So I know a lot of people who do apps and technical stuff and whatever. They get together at coffee shops. They share ideas. They help each other on projects. They do all. I'd really like to see some sort of workspace environment for producers and people in the music industry where they can just sit in the room and work together and whatever. Cause it ain't going to happen. If you listening to me right now, it ain't going to happen in your bedroom. Like, okay, Lil Nas X is one in a freaking billion, right? But it's not going to happen sitting in your bedroom. You got to get out. Okay. You got to get out, meet people. You got to be old school. You got to work with people and Great. parlay in this business. Yeah. And education is never like educate like first of all how you producing and you can't even read music like right like you can't do notes you can't like the computer does it all for you it syncs everything up and all you do is put the beat and it makes the beat for you and whatever 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 but that's that's good greatness is where you want to try to be at and right. greatness is like okay i can do this it don't matter if you white black hispanic or whatever i can do this across the board right absolutely yep i agree well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Can you tell them, um, you know, I, I'm just mad because I know there are so many things that you have. We'll, we'll, you have we'll so come back. Stories. We'll come back. Um, thank you so much for sitting down with me, but tell them where they can find you on social media since yeah. we talked about how important that is. Social media is real easy. So my social media, I keep it simple. It's at Frank Ski. Simple. And at, at Frank Ski. I told you it wasn't hard. And, to I, and, I, and, I, and I answer my own DMs and I don't. I don't let people read my emails and like, yeah. That's so, good. Yeah, my own stuff. They got a lot going on. I'm surprised you're able to do all of that. But it's okay. It's okay. So his DMs are open, you guys. So make sure y'all go ahead and slide in those DMs, ask some more questions if we didn't get to it. As always, thank you for listening. Um, you can find this podcast on all social media platforms at IDM Podcast, as well as myself at Sammy Approved. Thank you, Frank. Thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate you. Sign